we're at the bottom of Kakapuku Mountain and we're going to try and make it to the top. I've got a bit of a team to help push me up. Are you getting some push from the side no. drive pit? A little bit, yeah. I well, am. bits of it are quite tough. There's going to be some challenges that we'll have to work out as we go along, but she's got a good group of friends coming to help. I really blown away with her challenges that she said herself. I don't know how she's going to climb this mountain. I've climbed that mountain and it's pretty hard work. I've always been a mountain climber and since my accident I've found a really important part of my recovery is reclaiming these parts of myself that have been a sense of my identity and finding new ways to keep them alive. I'm Pieta, I am 20 years old. I'm quite adventurous, quite caring. I like getting out and doing stuff and pushing the limits, and I like having fun. Ah! It's been two years since my accident, and it's been quite the journey for me and all my friends and family, figuring out what life looks like now. Dad, just let go, let me try this first. I don't want to get it working. No one can really imagine what it would be like to break your back and paralyze yourself. My family and friends really brought an able-bodied perspective into it where being in a wheelchair is the worst thing that could happen to you. And, you know, worst case scenario was I couldn't walk again. But I've found if I can just do the things I used to do and be happy. People really seem to respond well to it. And so for me, climbing Kakapuku is just about getting a team together and to achieve something that they have assumed I can't do. I've got all my off-road gear on. This one lifts up these little caster wheels off the ground so that they don't get caught in little bumps. And then I've got my BMX tires and the motor on the back. Usually I will plan things for myself that I know I'm going to be able to do. And this one's a little bit out of my comfort zone. It's like, I don't know if it's going to work. I broke my back at the T10, T11 vertebrae, which is about my belly button. So I have no movement from below my belly button. And I can feel a little bit, like, not hot or cold or any light touch or anything. I use a wheelchair to get around. I can't stand up or walk, but I can still do pretty much everything. I'm flatting in Auckland with my sister and four other flatmates. My sister found this flat, which happens to be very wheelchair friendly. It's all perfectly kitted out. Like even the carpet's easier to roll on. And there's gaps under the stove and under the sink and under the bench in the kitchen, so I can have my workspace right here. Hi, George. So there are six of us in the flat, and we each cook one night of the week. The hard thing for me is when I have to pick things up with two hands, and then I can't move anywhere. Um, like, if I wanted to take this back to the sink, I'd have to put it on my lap, but I can't do that if it's hot. Or, like, getting a hot tray out of the oven, I couldn't really do because my tipping point is about here, so I can't, like, lean forwards and sit back up without pushing off something with my hands. <sighs> Marika, will you please come help with the potatoes? Living with my big sister, Marika, is pretty good. She's technically my carer. Will you please just drain them? Mm -hmm. And then, but then I need you to shake the whole pot. Yeah, yeah. She was okay. my main support person when I was in rehab. I just love her attitude. She's completely different than everyone else. And Marika wouldn't be like, this sucks, but you're going to have to deal with this, like, brush yourself off and get up and, and do what you have to do. And that's kind of what I needed to hear. Are you feeling your recipe? Yes. I think it's been definitely a bit of a roller coaster for our mum and dad. I think they both went through a lot of grief and just a lot of worry about what would happen, what Peter's life would turn out to be. I have my broccoli. Growing up, Pieta was uh, the crazy one. She was always running around trying to get us to play games and do things, skiing off cliffs. It would be me and her going out mountain biking and cycling and climbing mountains and stuff with our dad. 
leaving their brothers at home. I moved to Ecuador in, at the start of 2019. Just finished high school and I was on a gap year. I'd been there for about five months, teaching English in a village and doing some environmental work. And my family had come over to see where I'd been living and go on a bit of a holiday. And I took them to my village to meet all the families I'd been staying with and the people I'd been working with. You know, the thing that really struck me when I was there is that the whole village knew Peter and they all loved her and, you know, she would be walking through the village and everyone was saying hi. On the day of my accident, we bussed to the nearest town and then we had lunch in the restaurant. And then we were walking down and they have this big swing and you swung down over the hill. I went on it like every week, it was so much fun. So I was like, oh, we've got to have a go on the swing and I made my little sister go first. And then my boyfriend at the time went on it and as he was going on it, I thought I would just be cool and grab on and go along for the ride but I didn't get a proper grip. When we were right at the peak of the swing, my hand slipped and I fell. Down below there was a road and I just happened to fall onto the brick track instead of onto the long grass next to it, flat on my back and broke my spine at T10 and punctured a lung. She was unconscious when I first found her, but she woke up fairly quickly and in a lot of pain. There's no ambulance service or air ambulance or anything like that in Ecuador. So the village came there with a ute and we put a mattress on the back of the ute and rushed off into Quito. We eventually got her into this hospital on a ventilator and some pain medications. And that was probably three or four hours after the accident. Very traumatic. Worst day of my life. And as soon as what had happened happened, I thought, you know, as long as she survives, if she's alive, we can cope with anything else. And that's what I just kept telling myself. And, and you know, there was touch and go moments there in that first month. She got pneumonia in Ecuador and it's like, legs are optional, breathing's not optional. While I was in Ecuador, my parents were telling me I'd go back to rehab in New Zealand and learn how to walk. That never happened. We came back to Middlemore and the rehab doctors came to visit and they were like, chances of recovery are really low. And I didn't really care at that time. <laughs> I think I was never really expecting to walk again. It feels pretty obvious when you are lying there, you can't feel your legs, you can't move them. Some people wanted me to try meditating myself better or try acupuncture or trying to give me hope. And I didn't really want that because I didn't really, I couldn't make myself believe it. And I just wanted to get into a wheelchair and make this new way of life work for me. And after my accident, I wasn't allowed to sit up in a wheelchair for a couple months. And for me, worst case scenario was that I was still stuck in bed. Getting in a wheelchair sounded great. After she recovered from her back operation, then she got pneumonia and we were in the hospital in Ecuador for about a month. The first air ambulance flight that she did from Ecuador up to LA, the medics on that flight just didn't pay any attention and they weren't moving her and rolling her and by the time she got to LA and handed over to some Australian medical crew, they said, you know, she's got problems with the pressure sore. They looked after her really well on the trip back, but it was too late. She just had to stay in bed for about three months before she could get up and get in a wheelchair. Oh, it took her a long time to get back in a chair. We had a lot of issues with bed sores. But once she was allowed back up, she was pretty fierce about it. She didn't want to stick to the restrictions of you know, only half an hour or whatever it was. Um, she'd be wanting to go and play basketball and um, go down to the garden and do as much as she can until she was absolutely collapsing. And once I was up in a chair, I think it was only another like four or five weeks and then I was out of there. Well, 
When I was in rehab, I had no idea if I would ever be independent again with my personal cares. I really started from scratch. Everything's just a little bit harder. Like, everything just takes a little bit longer. I have to get into my commode, my shower chair to shower and use the bathroom. I don't have any bladder or bowel function, so I have to do that manually. That's taken a bit of adjustment to learn what works for me, and everyone does it slightly differently. So a big part of the journey since my accident has been learning to listen to my body. Now it sort of seems like it's speaking a different language. Now I've learned to read the signs from my body and to look after myself. And so I've managed to get my morning routine time down, so it only takes me an, an hour to get ready if I'm doing well. And I'm independent, and that gives me so much freedom in my day-to-day -day life. So I think my life now is pretty much very similar to what it would have been if I hadn't broken my back. I would have come back and gone to uni and probably flatted in Auckland anyway. I've gotten a new car since I had my accident and it was huge for me. It gave me so much more independence and so much freedom to do what I wanted to. It has an Abbey loader that brings my wheelchair into the boot for me. And it has hand controls installed. It was actually pretty easy to learn how to control with hand controls. I push forwards to brake and then I push down to accelerate. And my left hand is on a spinner, which means I can do tight circles. And it's also got all the controls on there for the indicator and headlights and window wipers. When I'm thinking about going somewhere new, I have to think things through before I go places. Like, I have to make sure it's accessible. But I'm pretty privileged that access isn't too big of an issue for me. I don't really let anything get in my way if I really want to do something. She's still a battler. Um, she has still never let anyone tell her no. She is a fighter and just will do whatever she wants and whatever she puts her mind to. I study a conjoint degree in health science and global studies at Auckland Uni. I'm majoring in population health, keeping a population at whole healthy. Cool. Oh, Alyssa, how's it going? I find people who are my age who meet me act completely normal. People more middle-aged will sometimes just ask me what happened to me first thing that comes out of their mouth, which I always find a little bit intrusive. That's not the most important thing about me. Like, maybe get to know me first before you ask me about the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to me or whatever. We must be about three and a half kilometres up. Yeah, we've lost the mountain bike track sort of thing, and um, it's a bit more rough now. We're making better progress than I thought we would, actually. Yeah, it's a good team. Good sharing the workload. Go left. She was always active. She's determined to get back into sports. Obviously, there's some sports that she won't be able to do anymore, but there are a lot that she still can. Just. Any opportunity that comes up, she just grabs it with both hands. <laughs> this is Jake. He's my climbing buddy. Takes me rock climbing. Um, so. That's all I can think of to say about you. Okay. What else am I supposed to say? Got pretty cool adventures. Yeah, Jack piggybacks me onto the beach. That's why I keep him around. <laughs> I like to keep myself busy with a lot of sports. I've been playing basketball, and I also have been really getting into paracycling, hand cycling, but I'm always trying new sports. I love going to the beach, which is really a great hobby to have as a wheelchair user. It means I need to have strong friends who can piggyback me onto the beach, but we make it work. I used to rock climb while I was in high school with my dad. 
I think it was a parafed event. Someone emailed me and was like, oh, we're going rock climbing. I was like, okay. And I went there and I was the only one in a wheelchair and I was like, oh, how is this going to work? But the man at Extreme Edge rigged up the special belay system that could get me up the wall, so that was really cool to get back into that. Before it might have been more about technique, it's more now about willpower and stamina and strength. When I'm better, stop. She's definitely really determined. She is super strong. I was so impressed at how strong she was when she first came in for that first time and she just keeps improving every time she comes in. Here's the tricky section. Oh, good press, what else? I think it's a, quite a unique sport in that you get these little bursts of a sense of achievement and you can really challenge yourself, but it is really hard. Like, it, I don't think I've chosen an easy sport to get into. I think one of the best things I've learned since becoming paralysed is asking for help. It feels like you're being a burden, but it's actually such a gift because people love helping. Well, her friend group have been fantastic. Really, really close group of friends from school, but she's you know, developed new friends up in Auckland as well. And they're fantastic. They just carry on being Peter's good mates. You're going to be right for this, Jake. It's a pretty big yeah. flight. Damage. I don't think I'll be doing too much after that, though. But... <laughs> my support system are the most important part of my life. When I got back from Ecuador, I remember thinking, as long as I get to see everyone and spend time with my friends and family, I'll still be happy. I'll still have a happy life. You OK? Yeah. Oh, hey. Woo! My friends have been really great. They've been right by my side the whole time. And they always make sure to include me, which I really appreciate. They've learned how to help me get upstairs and downstairs. They've learned how to fit my wheelchair into their cars so I can go places with them and stuff. That is pretty good at getting me up and down steps. Yeah. I mean, a lot of practice. Yeah, I've carried you on my back a few times. Yeah, yeah, I, I did get pickbacks. You don't time. trust me enough. I think you're exaggerating. Yeah. In the crowds. Oh, do you want to push? Like, do you want to push? Like, no, no, no. I'm good. But yeah, yeah, like, all right, just keep walking. <laughs> I think we can't achieve our full potential as a society if we're not realising the full potential of disabled population who have barriers. I'm just gonna go to the bathroom. I think there's a lot more we can be doing to make public places more accessible for everyone. So in Maddie's house, I pee into the bath because I don't fit in the toilet, which is actually a common theme in um, lots of people's houses tend to have tiny little toilets. But luckily, I pee through, like, a straw, so I can just get the straw going into the bath. This is my pee kit uh, that I use to pee. And so this is called a catheter. It's pretty much like a straw that goes into my bladder so I can empty it because I can't... I don't have the muscle control to choose to pee anymore. And so I just connect it to this longer tube that I can put in the bath and um, got hand sanitizer in here so I don't give myself a bladder infection and some lube and then I just put this without touching it um, into my bladder so I can drain it out. I've always been a writer. I used to write for like the community newsletter when I was a kid. And so I started a blog when I went overseas just to keep people updated. And then when I injured myself, everyone was really concerned about how I was doing mentally and how I was dealing with it. And so I shared a little bit about my thought process and how it felt to me and what I'd noticed about how people around me responded. My most recent piece, I wrote a piece for um, All Is For All's blogging platform, I think it's called Amplify, about disability pride and how to find um, pride in the disabled community and how to be proud of my disabled body. I think there's just the underlying assumption that a disabled person has a worse life or that's something to feel pity for them. But then you listen to the disabled community, all these people who are, who are super happy and vibrant and 
they love the bodies they're in. It's like it actually doesn't have to be such a negative thing. That's sort of our ableist lens that we put on things. I come up and see Peter whenever I can, really. Check that the flat's reasonably tidy and that there's food in the fridge. It's not your birthday hummus store. It is my birthday hummus. It's like three weeks ago. Her attitude right from the beginning is, I'm not broken, don't try and fix me. And so she set that tone. Am I to choose my own mug? No. Look, I got a mug for my birthday. And she hasn't wallowed in self-pity. And she didn't need an awful lot of encouragement or bolstering up or, or pep talking. She's probably the one that pep talked us, really. I think I'm proudest of the way that she's used her situation to increase awareness and caring for others and be a spokesperson for disability in general. For me, Mum and Dad have always been really supportive. I'm really lucky to have them. Mum's been a big emotional support and she'll be the one I go to when I have problems or I'm stressed. And Dad always helps in really practical ways. It's a nice thing from her guitar. If I want to do something, he'll think of a way to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we're proud with the way that she's managed being faced with a disability and just carrying on with life. I think there'll be lots of opportunities for her. Don't know where it'll go, but it'll be good. Yeah, I think if you look back, whenever you go through a trauma like that, you know, they say within two years you come back to either your, to your normal level of happiness. And I would say we're definitely there. Yes. Woohoo! Not as deep as I used to be. Yeah. We just have someone. I'll, I'll just go behind just in case you. Behind, yeah. Just in case you to lose balance or something. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, it's just. Okay, so much. I can't really imagine a life without going on adventures or without planning trips and and making things happen. Woo! Look at that view. All right. We're at the top of Kakapuku. Um, we made it. Summit day. The sense of achievement is shared, I think. But that's kind of a good thing, too. I think it's a good way to clear your head and challenge yourself and show yourself what you can achieve if you put your mind to it. <laughs>